Peter writes to inform the church that in the latter days, they're going to come scoffers. And what they're going to do is challenge the validity and the word of God. But I need you to know that there is hope still in the day of the Lord. We're going to talk about this in our subject entitled Hope in the Day of the Lord. There are notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description below and in the comment section. Click that link. Get your notes, your Sunday school books, and your Bibles. Hurry. Because the Sunday school is now in session. Join me. Let's go. Teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence. Join Elder Rodney Jones with our Sunday school lesson. Building and equipping the children of God. Grab your Bibles, grab your notes. Get your lessons and get ready. Now let's Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sunday School Lesson as taught by Pastor Rodney Jones. I'm the pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries, Church of God in Christ. We're located 1700 West 87th Street, right here in the city of Chicago. If this is your first time, please leave me a message in the comment section below that this is your first time. I'd like to welcome you to Sunday School. If you have not already done so, please take a moment. Click that subscribe button, which is at the bottom. It's a free subscription. Click the bell notification. And lastly, click all so that YouTube will notify you each week. Bing! Brother Jones finally uploaded another lesson. We've been kind of busy doing funerals, graduations, and all of this this week, uh, and, and including ministry. But God is still great. We got an interesting lesson on today. We're talking about a subject that should have been talked about long time ago. It's something about people who don't have an understanding of the word of God. Then there are those who are false teachers who are teaching what's called damnable doctrines. And we're going to show you that Peter calls them scoffers. And what they do is they speak against God. They challenge the validity of God and they challenge the word of God. As a matter of fact, if there is no hope, then the people of God would be in trouble. So in this lesson, what is it entitled? I believe it is entitled, and let me find it. Yeah, there it is. I found it. <laughs> this lesson is entitled Hope in the Day of the Lord. We're in Second Peter, the third chapter, Verses 1 through 15a. Our date for discussion is May the 28th, 2023. I believe this is called Pentecostal Sunday. Happy Pentecostal Day to you all. I'll bring this announcement up at the end of this lesson. And we thank you, God, for this opportunity, for this moment. And we pray that you would be glorified as we teach this lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're dealing with this uh, hope in the day of the Lord. We talked about this, and we're going to bring up these scoffers. Some say scoffers, some say scoffers. It all depends. Let's get into the reading of our word. All right, let me get that out the way. Boom, there it is. He says, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds, by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of uh, uh, the Lord and Savior. So let's see what we can get out of this. So the writer, which we understand is Peter Petros, he says that this is the second epistle. Now, an epistle is a letter that is written. He said, now, this is the second one that I'm writing. I love how he addresses them. He addresses them as beloved. 
or the love or even the love of God or even a special group of individuals. Peter's writing to tell them and to warn them of impending danger. And I believe every minister, preacher, prophet, evangelist, apostle, whoever, need to warn the people of impending danger because if you don't warn them and then they die or suffer, the Bible says in Ezekiel that the blood is required upon your hands. And therefore, when we know things, we ought to give out that information. He says, I'm writing this unto you. Now watch what he says. In both of these epistles, what he says he does is he stir up your pure minds. I love the fact that they have a pure or sincere mind. And how he says he's doing is, is uh, by way of remembrance. By way of remembrance. I've got to keep you all, keep your mind remembered or keep it afresh. From time to time, I like to revisit some of the sermons that I have preached or ministered to the people. Not because I ain't got nothing to talk about, but because every now and then, from time to time, it needs to be refreshed. Uh, I don't know for some reason we talk about preachers who preach the same sermon, yet we preach the same, we sing the same solo. We sing the same, we play the same music. The radio station play the same music, the same song eight times in one day because it is the request of the Lord, of the people, I should say. He says, the what I'm trying to get you to do is to be mindful. I want you to be mindful of two things he mentions that he wants them to be mindful of. Mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and of the commandments which he says of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus. So in both letters, he stirs up the minds of the people. Now, uh, there was a false teaching about the promise that Jesus had mentioned or that the scriptures said that he would come back or make a second return, a second event, or his final coming. But there were false teachers who were challenging the word because of this expansion of time. And they began to challenge the word of God. When you challenge the word of God, you challenge God. He said that this is my second letter or epistle. He says, now what I'm doing is I'm stirring up. And the word stir up means to wake up. It means to awaken or to arouse from sleep. There's something that might be lying dormant within your mind. And what I'm coming to do is to stir that up or to awaken or to wake this up. Because this is not information that you didn't know was going to happen. And the information he's talking about is the second coming of the Lord. As a matter of fact, this whole thing. This whole lesson is about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. He calls it in the last days because the first one is when Jesus first came on this earth. The second one would be called the last days. And this has been a very long time. As a matter of fact, growing up as a child, we heard that he's coming again. He says he mentions the word remembrance, which means a reminding. He said that you may be mindful of the words, mindful. Now the word mindful means to be recalled or to recall or return to one's mind, to remind one's self or even to remember because the prophets of the Old Testament made mention of his coming and the apostles made mention of it as well. I believe when he uses the term holy apostles, He's possibly speaking about the Old Testament when he uses the prophets, uh, the apostles, <laughs> his New Testament. The prophets would be the Old Testament because God spoke through both the old and the new. Here he uses the word and of the commandment of us. Here the word commandment means an order, a command, a charge, a precept, or even an injunction. So I believe that he's referring to not just the commandment, but the commandment and or teachings of Christ himself as he gave them to the apostles to give to the people of God. Let's look at number uh, three 
and possibly four. Yep, I thought so. He says, knowing this first. Now, the first thing that he wants to remind them of or even to inform them of. Because apparently this has not come yet. So he says that there shall come. Notice that shall come. When is this going to happen? In the last days. How do you know that this is the last days? Because they are here. Who is he referring to? He's calling them scoffers. Now watch this. They're not walking in God. They're not walking in the way of God. They're not walking in holiness. They're not uh, uh, listening to the spirit of God, the leading of God, the comforting of God. They've not cared about Jesus or nothing. What they are doing is they're doing something that's against God. They are walking right there after their own lusts. Not only are they walking after their own lust, he said, but them rascals are opening up their mouth right here and saying, here's what the challenge is. And here's the twofold statement that they're making. Number one, they're saying, where, where is the promise? Where's the promise of his coming? Where, uh-oh, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> where, where's the promise of his coming? That would be the second coming of Jesus. So that's question. Then the statement that they would make is for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So the first thing he wants to put on the floor is Peter makes a, a, a he, he places a group that is in a very dangerous place because what happens is this group and it's interesting that people can be easily persuaded when they don't have a foundation in the Lord. I'll say that again. People can be easily persuaded when they don't have a foundation in the Lord. When they are not rooted and grounded in God, they can be easily swayed, easily removed from the foundation, the understanding. And that's why it's important for believers to search God daily, to study and to lay before the Lord continually to rise up early to seek him and not listen to everybody. I'm sorry. Sometimes you need to shut some people down, shut them off and stop. And Facebook is messing us up with all of these homemade biblical references. Come on, somebody. But I'm going to keep on moving. He makes mention of these scoffers and these scoffers are false teachers. And what they're doing is teaching something that's against God, but they will take hold of many people which will follow them because they're going to say, wait a minute, you're right. He hasn't come here yet. And you're right. He has been promising to come for a very long time, but where is he? And the believers have got to be careful that they don't fall into that trap. Scoffers means a false teacher or scoffer. It means a marker. He said what they would be doing is walking Walking after their own lust. The word walking means to continue one's journey or even to live. After or according to their own lust. The word lust would mean their desire, their craving, their longing, or even a desire for what is forbidden. He mentions the last day, which is the season of his return. Because we do look for the return of Christ in what's called the last days. The question is, where is his promise? The word promise means an announcement that one has made. Promise. It is, an, it is also the act of promising. So the question is, and I'm blurry. The question is, where is this second coming? When they challenge the second coming, they challenged the one who gave the promise, which was God. And many people would challenge the word of God and cause people to re be removed from the will of God. Where are the indications of his return? Where is it? He has promised that he is coming, but he has not made his arrival. So he's challenging God himself. Then it says, for since the fathers fell asleep, and these fathers will most likely be their ancestors, and the word fall asleep simply means since they have died. 
and gone off the scene and they've been gone for many years and yet his promise was made, but he's not here. And then everything, he says, all things have continued as though they were from the beginning. So he promised that he would return, but nothing has happened yet. Everything is still the same since creation. Where is he? Where is this promise? And how come he has not made his arrival yet is the challenge that they are doing. Hope in the day of the Lord. Then look at what the writer says. He says, for this. Now watch this. They are willingly ignorant. They are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God, watch this, the heavens, let me, let me, let me do this. Watch how this was done by the word of God. Right here, the word of God. The heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perish. Verses 5. So the scoffers, they challenged the word of God concerning the return of Christ. They said nothing changed since creation. And Peter will show them something that did change since the creation of heaven and the earth. But Peter said that they were not just ignorant of this, he said, but they were willful ignorant. That's a willful rejection. That's a thing that you did for real, for real. <laughs> to be willingly ignorant is not uh, to want, it's to not to want something. It's to really close your ears, but there's a part two to this. Remember we always speak about my people perish for lack of knowledge? Well, it says the people perish for lack of knowledge, but they perish for lack of knowledge because they have rejected this knowledge, Hosea 4 and 6. So their ignorance is voluntary. It is their will not to know the truth so that they can be ignorant. He says willingly, which means to intend to be resolved or determined. Willingly means to purpose and to purpose cheerfully and with the free will they are ignorant. Here the word ignorant means to be hidden from or secretly or unawares. The word ignorant here means without knowing or even to escape the knowledge of. So to be ignorant of something means not to know or have a knowledge of something. Peter said that they are willingly ignorant of God's word, which calls creation to exist. Not only did his word cause creation to exist, but it brought destruction to creation. They will purposely forget the account of the flood in Genesis 6. And Peter could be saying that they gladly allow to escape their knowledge as it relates to the flood. He says that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. The word of old means long ago. So Peter first speaks of the creation of the heavens from the word of God. The Bible lets us know that God is the one that established the earth and the foundation, Psalm 24. God spoke the heavens into existence, Genesis 1. Uh, Psalm 33 and 9 lets us know that it was God that spoke it. He spoke creation. The Bible said he commanded and it stood fast, Psalm 33 and 9. This is by the same word of God. He says also, and the earth standing out of the water and in. The word standing means to put together, unite parts in one or into one whole. It means to be composed of or even to consist. This is a reference still to the creation of the earth when he separated the dry land, standing out of. He separated the dry land and called it earth. That's what this is a reference to. So God brought the earth out of water and then he surrounded it by water. Genesis, the first chapter. He says, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. 
whereby means through, through the world, or through, the, it was overflow, sorry about that, overflow, which means to submerge, to submerge. So whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, it perished. It was destroyed. It was ruined. So whereby points to God's word. That's what I'm trying to say as it relates to the water destroyed. It was the word of God that spoke creation. It was the same word of God that brought ruin or destruction. And he used the same water that he created the earth and the world with. Verses number seven, he says what? I'm getting dizzy. Hurry up and stop. There you go. But the heavens and the earth, which are now. Watch what he says. The heavens and the earth by the same word, which is the word of God. Watch what he says about them. Are kept. Not only are they kept, but they are kept in store. Now, there is a purpose for them being kept. It is reserved unto. Sometimes the word unto means the purpose, the point that is trying to be reached. It is now reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So he knows how to keep this earth reserved against the day of judgment and perdition of who? These ungodly men. God is preserving. Now, there's a twofold reason because they're godly men that he's preserving as well so that we can receive our reward. So God spoke the original creation of the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1. He spoke its destruction through a flood Genesis 6 through the 8th chapter. The heavens and earth are now remaining at the same word. And everything is moving by the power of God and by the word of God. Heaven and earth are now kept in store by his word until the day of judgment. And this judgment and perdition are against ungodly men. The heavens and earth will be destroyed again, but not by water but by fire. He mentions no more of water in Genesis 9. He said nothing about fire in Genesis 9. He said that it is kept in store, which means to reserve. It is the word of God that has the heavens and the earth kept by his word. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It is reserved. The word reserve here means to attend to carefully and even to take care of. So God got his eye, not just his eye, but God has his hand on the heaven and the earth. And God has them sitting there, remaining there and kept in store. It is reserved, which also means to guard unto the day of perdition. The word perdition means destroying or utter destruction, a perishing, the destruction which consists of eternal misery in hell of these ungodly men or wicked, sinful, or even destitute of reverential awe towards God. Ungodly are people who are destitute of their reverence or reverential awe towards God. So the earth is kept by the word of God for a future purpose, intent, and a future usage. Verses number eight, he says, but, ah, that's beautiful right there. Mm. There you go, call them names again. <laughs> Beloved, be not ignorant. The word ignorant means without knowing. Be not ignorant of this. Now watch this, it's interesting, the word ignorant. As it relates to the scoffers, they are willfully ignorant. But he's writing to remind them and says to them, don't be ignorant of this one thing. The reason why it's taken so long is one day, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years with the Lord is as one day. I think as the song says to you, 40 years is but one hour. So if one day with God 
is as if a thousand years. What do you do when God says, I'll be there in a minute? Mm. Because above heaven, there is no time. God created heaven and earth below him and placed time there. God is not subject to time. God doesn't move according to man's time. God moves according to his time, which is a different type of time, which we actually call it seasons. Mm. So one day with God is that so it took right to, to be honest with you. If Jesus died and rose again 2000 years ago in God's eye, it happened two days ago, which means his blood is still fresh. Oh, my God, today. Thank you, Lord. Uh, he said, now, here we go. Now, they have already challenged the Lord and said that he's slack concerning his promise. He didn't got lazy. He didn't, he didn't, he's delaying. Uh, he has not allowed it to come. So they're challenging the word of God. But look what Peter said. He said, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. The thing is with God is he is long suffering. Yes, there it is. He is long suffering to us. Not only, and the reason is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, hear me, saints. I made a post on the book called The Face, and some people misunderstood it, which is fine with me. Based on this scripture, if it is not the will of God that any should perish, how do we rightly justify the fact that people say that Judas was born to betray Jesus? And since he was born to betray Jesus, then how do we justify it's not God's will that any should perish? Because we believe that Judas perished. Something's not lining up to me. And so therefore, never teach what you've heard. Only teach what you've read. I read nowhere in scripture where it said Judas had to be. We look at a word which should betray him. That word should means to intend. Come on. It was his intention to betray Jesus. But watch this and I'm going to move on. The Bible says that Judas was a thief. Number two, Jesus understood that he was a devil. Now watch this. The Bible says that Satan entered into him. Now, if he was born the son of perdition, the devil never would have entered into him. He would have been born that way. Jesus was born holy, and we never see where the Holy Ghost entered into Jesus. He was born with the Holy Ghost. Don't worry about that dog. That was for John the Baptist to understand who Jesus was. Watch this. Nowhere in scripture do you see where it pinpointed that Judas had to do it. However, in order for it to betray, it had to be somebody close by you because your enemies cannot betray you. Mm. Therefore, in my conclusion, my Kojic third conclusion, I think we need to stop listening to popular teaching and start reading the scripture. What do y'all think about that? <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Come on. I know we shifted for a moment, but go ahead and put your answers down there. What do y'all think about it? And go ahead if you have scripture. Now, remember, your scripture must pinpoint. Because watch this lastly. The Bible said that when Judas saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented. The son of perdition would not repent. Hear me now. He repented and he went back to those same men. He says, I have done wrong, but they refused to hear him. Then he committed suicide. Mm. So somebody said he should have repented to Jesus. Really? How was he going to repent to Jesus when Jesus was already captured? Come on. Oh, he should have repented to God. Uh, Y'all, you know, we can just throw anything. He repented to man. He went back to the people who he did this with to try to make ends right so that they can release them. Come on, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm just saying, it's not God's will. He ain't sending nobody to hell. 
My daddy said, we just insist on going. <laughs> Woo Not willing that any should perish, but it's his will that all. So the reason why the Lord has not come back, the reason why he has, uh, has what you all think he is slacked, Peter says he's not slack. And the word slack means to delay or to be slow. And then he uses the word slackness, which means slowness or delay or even tardy. God ain't tardy. He's long suffering, which means to exercise patience, to endure patiently. And the reason why he has not returned is he is patiently waiting on us to repent because it's not his will that any should perish, but he wants everybody to be saved. He said, now watch this, but the day of the Lord is coming. Rest as sure, as sure as whatever is sure. He says, the day of the Lord will come. But when it comes, it's going to come as a thief in the night, which means unexpectedly yeah, and suddenly. He's going to come as a thief in the night. And look at what he says is going to take place. The heavens is going to pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works, everything that has been created upon the earth for man to live by is going to be burned up in this day. We won't need the things of the earth because we're going back with him when he comes. He says the heavens are going to melt with a great noise. Oh, my God. Can you think and fancy the heat? That's going to take place. This fervent heat is going to be so hot until the heavens and all of the elements as we know it are going to melt in that day. So seeing this, watch this then. I'm getting dizzy. Okay, I'm done being dizzy. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be? and all holy conversation and godliness. Looking for and hasting until the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's a statement question. Seeing then, seeing then uh, that all these things shall be dissolved. Here's the question. What type? What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy uh, conversation and uh, godliness? So there will come a day that all of this will take place. It's what Peter is saying. And why or what type of person should you be since you know that this is going to take place? The scoffer will come and teach differently. If they believe this, they will follow the scoffers. The day of the Lord will be unique. The earth and the heaven is going to be judged that day. He says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. The word dissolved means to melt, to loose, to release, to abolish, or to be destroyed. The word dissolved here is the same word as the word melt in verses 10. The world as we know it will not be the same when he returns. This last and final destruction will affect the heavens and the earth. Here, the heaven can't mean where God dwell. That would be below where God, because where he is, is pure and holy. He says, what manner or what sort of quality of persons ought you to be or is necessary for you to be in all conversation, which is a manner of life. Conversation is your conduct, your behavior, or your deportment. He mentions godliness, which means reverence, respect, or even piety towards God because these scoffers did not reverence God. He says you ought to be reverencing and revering and respecting God even in the life that you're living. Not only that, he says looking. The word looking means to anticipate, to wait, or even to expect. Looking for and hasting. Hasting is a very unique word. It means to await eagerly and to desire earnestly. So the day of the Lord will come and we will live a life in expectation of him. The Bible says to them that look for him to return, shall he come again? 
or appear, Hebrews 9 and 28. Peter is saying that the believer should desire earnestly, which means hasting his return. Now, I believe that that word hasting also means, uh, and I believe that the quicker we get right, the quicker and the sooner he comes. He told the, the disciples to preach the gospel. He that believe and is baptized shall be saved. Watch this. He's waiting on us to repent. When the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, and the evangelists, the missionaries, when the body of Christ, the leader or leadership, does what do what we're supposed to do, if we all stop scandalizing one another's name, stop putting people's uh, uh, downfalls and shortcomings on Facebook, and if all of us collectively begin to preach for Christ Jesus, the world will hear about the gospel sooner than God can come sooner is another word for Hastings as well. Let's close this lesson. This is my third closing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we, we, watch this, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing as the word seeing again, that you look for such things that he mentioned previously, he says, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, without spot and blameless. So moreover, we trust his promises that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. We live in expectation of his return. He spoke creation into existence. He spoke destruction of the flood. And he has promised that he will return. And we live in expectation of his return. This new heaven and earth will be sinless and contain righteousness only. Righteous men, righteous living. Since the believers look for this, Peter said to be diligent. Now he says, nevertheless, which means moreover, Look for or looking for, which means to anticipate, to wait and to expect. While the scoffers challenge the promise of God, we expect them to come. They challenge the promise of his second coming. We expect him to return. We look forward to his return and for the new heavens and the earth wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, because believers, we depend on and we stand on his promises. He says to be diligent, which means to hasten. Be diligent, to hasten, make haste, or to exert one's self, or even to endeavor. Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blemish. So while we're waiting for these things to happen, he says to make every effort to be found living a righteous life. And then he says, lastly, accounting an account that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. The reason why God is taking his time to come here is so that all would be and could be saved. He sent the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross that we would be saved. That is the purpose of his blood is for salvation. His blood is not used to sprinkle on your wall. His blood is not used to sprinkle against your job or on your children. Mm -mm. God never gave us the blood of his son to use. He used the blood of his son on us because through his blood, we are healed. Through his blood, we are saved. Through his blood, we are sanctified. Through his blood, we are cleansed. Through his blood, we have access to heaven. He gave us his name to cast out devils. He gave us his name to pray to the Father, but he never gave us his blood. So no, you cannot plead the blood of Jesus. He never gave it to you to plead. You can't call those things that be not. That's God's job. He calls those things that be not. We do what Jesus said, and that's to speak to the mountain. I'll give you this uh, advertisement or what I want to call it. I don't know what I'm going to call it, but there it is right there. June 10th is coming up from 10 to 2 o'clock in-house, in-person 
at the church where I pastor is I, I am the Sunday school superintendent of the Illinois Third Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction of um, Illinois. <laughs> bishop Roland T. Sanders is my bishop. And we will have our Sunday school conference. We're going to be dealing with effective teaching. We're going to be dealing with engaging your audience. We're going to be dealing with how to prepare for your lessons. And then my sister, Dr. Milam, is going to teach us how to use Kahoot. Kahoot is an interactive software, online software, that you can use right there in your classroom with your youth, and they can interact with you. They can take tests. They can play games, whatever the case may be. And we're going to hear from the vice president of the International Sunday School Department, my friend and my brother, Elder Michael Payton from First Jurisdiction of Illinois. He's going to teach and talk about don't take a knife to a gunfight. Oh, my. We want you to be prepared. There is it. Uh, you go to Eventbrite. It's right there on there, Eventbrite, third jurisdiction, ssd.eventbrite.com. If you have any questions, you can always email me to Rodney Jones Sunday School at gmail.com. Rodney Jones Sunday School at gmail.com. Remember to continue to move forward. Let me see what is it that you like about this lesson? What is it that you learned about it? And what would you like to add? What angles and what else that you saw? The teacher never sees everything. What are the things that you like to pull out or bring out? What did you get out of this lesson? Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this lesson. And also make sure you support this particular lesson. Um, uh, if it be the Lord's will, if the creek don't rise, if the Lord delays coming, and if I don't oversleep, I'll see you all Saturday morning at 9 a.m. for the live version of this Sunday School lesson. Continue to pray my strength in the Lord as we continue to move forward. I'm trying to shift these lessons to Monday, but there's so much that is involved in not just these lessons, but a whole lot of other things. Remember my motto, teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence. Peace.